Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this next edition of the Monday Majlises at the Center for the Study of Islam, Exeter. And it's my greatest joy to introduce you, Massimo, whom I met recently in, in a conference and um, at the Mesa in Denver. And, and this is the uh, incremental uh, value of conferences that you meet people you 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 wouldn't meet otherwise and and uh, we actually met before the conference officially started just just we uh, organizing our papers and I said by Massu and we started a discussion and I was quite sure that I would like to continue this discussion and hear more of Massimo's uh, life and and research so that's what we are going to do Thank you, thank you, Massimo, for coming. I, I mute myself and and please, I, we are listening to you. Thank you, thank you so much, Isvan, for your uh, invitation. First and foremost, I'm really glad to be here. And if I may be completely honest, a, a little bit intimidated by the quality of the audience, but I'm sure you're going to be merciful and lenient uh, <laughs> with me. Uh, so, so yes, my name is Massimo. I am uh, Italian, originally from a small city uh, close to Milan. Uh, I haven't lived, however, in my home country for the last, gosh, 17 years or something, uh, primarily to do what I like, which is, you know, uh, to uh, live the academic life where <laughs> you go around the world and trying to uh, understand uh, things better. And, um, well, first of all, I'm talking to you from uh, uh, Ifran, which is a small city in Morocco uh, over the Atlas Mountains. It's incredibly cold at the moment. Uh, we had like a Semi snowstorm over the weekend, which is not a usual image that you would have of Morocco, but such is life. It's, it's 1700 meters above sea level, and uh, you know, uh, Moroccans actually come here down from Fez and Casablanca to see snow whenever we have one of these uh, uh, storms. Um, Isfan asked me to, uh, you know, present my research, which is fine, of course, it's pretty commonplace, of course, to do so. But first, to start with my academic or life trajectory, uh, and uh, very gladly I will be doing so. Uh, and I also read the memo that Isvan shared with us uh, presenters in terms of what we should say in the first 20 minutes or so of our self-presentation. And uh, one thing that he insisted on, I think it was really nice uh, you know, to acknowledge that first and foremost, um, when we have to present ourselves, our superhero image of sort, superheroes are really flawed as well. And we have our fears and doubts and insecurities. We're all Batmans, basically, right? Super cool from the outside, but, you know, we're also Bruce Wayne and tortured souls from the inside. So I'll try to portray myself as a Batman of sort, if you will. Um, and when I was thinking about, okay, how do I, you know, explain what, uh, what, what I chose to do basically for a living. Um, I thought, okay, it, it goes back to that event. I was 20 years old when 9-11 happened. And I was a sophomore in college uh, in a small city close to Milan uh, uh, called the Pavia. And uh, I had no clue. I was studying political science, but I had no clue whatsoever how to understand what was going on. It was a, a, a moment of utter like incapacity to make sense as to why people would fly an aeroplane inside the World Trade Center. And out of that sheer curiosity mixed with the uh, um, sense of fear and threat, of course, uh, and sheer sense of ignorance, I told myself, okay, I need to learn more about this. And that was the beginning of what I tried to do, right? Which is you know, delve a little bit more into the history and politics of the Middle East, particularly the role of Islam in that uh, era of the world. And the more you study, the more you understand that <laughs> your ignorance really is boundless. There is no boundaries to what you do not know. And, you know, it, it is a reflection that I, um, you know, uh, came, um, came to only recently as to why I had a fascination with um, war views with characters, with ways of thinking that are completely alien to an extent to my own upbringing. You can imagine, you know, this Catholic boy growing up in Northern Italy, south of Milan, right? Uh, classic, like European setting, if you will. And I was fascinated by other possible understanding, especially when it comes to politics, but social life in general. 
um, different settings, different domains, different traditions. So one of the first, you know, people that I fell in love with, I mean, academically speaking, you, you will understand my preface here, of course, was Ayatollah Khomeini. For me, it was such a fascinating character. I did not understand why Khomeini happened. Why was he around? What was he saying, right? And then I, I you know, I started reading his uh, a lecture on the Islamic government that he, he issued, you know, he gave in uh, Najaf in 1970. It's like, this is unbelievable. It's a new universe that opens up in front of you. And the more I delved into that, the more I was fascinated with what I found. And what I found is this incredible mix that you can never really get a real hold of it. On the one hand, there is utter difference, a sense of, um, alienation from somebody like Khomeini or Bin Laden or whatever. And at the same time, a sense of like, we address similar concerns and similar issues. Politics is very different in different locales, and yet it has this common ground that unifies us all as human beings. And that is what I really love to see, the difference in, in, in commonalities and the commonalities in differences. And it's a process that is, it never ends. It's, it's so beautiful because it's continuously in the understanding of social reality. Um, and I had the chance, uh, I'm not sure why I decided that, but you know, I, I wasn't a good student, well, fair enough, given the work that I do, but I was never really uh, satisfied or content to learn things by books or articles or things of that nature, lectures. So when I got the chance, I thought to myself, okay, I, I really need to move away from my comfort zone and start exploring countries that lie beyond the Mediterranean. And um, at first, my, my experience was in North Africa and Tunisia. I also went to Sub-Saharan Africa in uh, Burkina Faso for a little bit in Kenya. And um, I got more and more fascinated. It was an orientalist disposition, I have to be honest with you guys. It, it was this fascination with the unknown to an extent. Um, and that entailed also a, a brief a period of study in, uh, in, the, in Damascus. Of course, this was before the war. And a decision to say, well, I want to do this as a job, right? So I got my um, uh, PhD accepted at Syracuse University. So I went to America. And, and there, that's when I really started to frame properly in a more analytical, rigorous fashion what I was trying to do. Uh, and some of it, perhaps, I hope it will, it will transpire uh, via the, uh, present, through the presentation uh, tonight. Um, after I got my PhD, um, sorry, as I was working for my PhD, I moved to Jordan to do my field research. So I lived for two years in, in Amman, which is still in my heart very deeply, not least because they have the best hummus that I've ever tried in my life. And I got addicted to that, to that when I, when I was living in Jordan, probably during, if, if I have enough time during spring break, uh, I'll go back, I'll go back to Amman for a little bit. And, um, I finished my PhD. I was, uh, you know, finishing up my research uh, in, in Jordan and I was looking for a job as any young graduate, pretty desperately, I have to say. So I applied pretty much anywhere from, you know, Santiago in Chile to Pyongyang in North Korea. If I had a place, I would just move there anywhere. And in this spectrum of possibilities, uh, I came across a offer from uh, um, Habib University in Karachi. Um, and I remember that moment vividly. I mean, I knew a little bit of Karachi and you do not know nice things about Karachi if you know a little bit about it. It's one of the most, uh, one of the most dangerous cities back then yeah, on the planet, one of the biggest one. I don't know how many people live in Karachi, any bet from 23 to, seven, seven, uh, 23 to 27 million people is a fair bet. And I looked it up, it was an interesting project. They wanted to create this liberal arts college in the American style in Karachi, in Pakistan. And I told myself, Massimo, be true to what you do. You, you like studying post-colonial politics. You like to study political Islam. You, you, you want to expose yourself to different ways of living. Well, yes, you have an offer to go back to the States, a uh, nice college in Wisconsin, or you can go to Karachi. And I said to myself, let's go to Karachi. It's going to be much more rewarding. And I was right. And I never regretted the choice. I lived uh, four years in Pakistan. And um, it was an incredibly 
enriching experience. I love every minute of it. I still have very fond memories, very good friends in, uh, in Karachi. And yes, it did, you know, show you, it does show you other ways in which, you know, uh, social and political life can be, um, can be lived and also very similar issues that people all across the spectrum face. Um, what happened is that not out of my choice, but basically the ISI, the uh, notorious uh, secret service in, uh, in Pakistan had a beef, I guess, with the university. And uh, as a collateral damage, I was not uh, given a new uh, work visa. So I was gently pushed out of the country. And uh, luckily enough, um, I found uh, a, um, a new position um, in, uh, in Morocco at al Hawain University. Uh, perhaps some of you may know uh, this university, which is again a similar experiment, a liberal college in a, a uh, Northern African Arab uh, Muslim uh, country. Um, so far so good, except for the for the cold, which is you know a good compensation between the heat of Karachi, uh, relentless heat uh, of the tropics, and you know I'd like to you know wrap it up, so to speak, uh, um, a little bit beyond the mere uh, chronological events that have, you know, uh, that I've described thus far. I, I really love what I do because I work in two institutions, first in Karachi and then here in Morocco, that are primed on teaching. They are liberal arts college, so primarily you are supposed to be a good teacher. And I know that academia, especially if you do a PhD, it's all about research, research, research. And there is this idea of perish or publish and uh, a lot of pressure in doing so. And I understand that as scholars, it is incredibly important to produce new knowledge. But, and here comes you know, the, the, the insecurity, the, um, uh, the, the, the Bruce Wayne stuff uh, to, to our Batman. I'm not a great researcher. I don't think I do that at my best, okay? I. I always look at other people, oh, they have more publications, they are more well-read, they are, you know, more expert on whatever topic. And that's absolutely fine, I have to say. It, it is something that I accept. And while I try to do my best as a researcher, I also know that academia offers you another path as well. And uh, to me, it's been incredibly rewarding. I love being in class with my students. I enter class and I exit and I really wonder, I get paid for this, really? Like, I'm going to get paid for something that I love to do. And fairly enough, I think I, I, that I can do pretty well. And um, that is because there is this human interaction while you teach. That is pretty, it's pretty priceless. There is, of course, the excitement when you do research and you write a good paper and you come up with a new idea. That's all, gr that's all great. That's all good. I know that excitement. At the same time, when you have an 18 year old that finally understands what Weber says about the state and you see the light bulbs going off, you're like, yeah, mashallah, that was so good to see. That was so good. And to me, it's priceless. And, uh, you know, I don't know if we have uh, probably found some young PhD or master students here in the audience as well. I would say consider that as an incredibly rewarding way to be a scholar, to transmit knowledge directly, not just through your papers, your publication, but on a face-to-face -face weekly interactions with people that may not end up, you know, being a researcher or, you know, scholars themselves, but that might benefit from the, you know, analytical <laughs> rigor, from the uh, uh, increased knowledge from interaction that you provide. And what I found is, you know, it's, it's one of the most enriching uh, um, sides of being a, uh, an academic. And the other thing that I discovered also, uh, for better or worse, both in Karachi and here, I've been asked to be a member of the administration, so to speak, like to complement my job as a faculty member, also to be part of the administration. And that's usually what faculty do not want to do necessarily, I understand. But there's something to be said about being part of a academic community and to give your contribution otherwise, uh, and try to say, okay, what do we want to teach? What is the curriculum? How do we improve our uh, processes and procedures and, and policy making towards, uh, you know, students, staff and faculty. Um, so, you know, faculty get evaluated be, uh, um, alongside um, research, teaching and service. And I would say all three components are good 
proper ways to be an academic. That we, we are part of a community. We have to serve the community. We have to teach because that's how you bring along your 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 uh, your knowledge to to the next generation. And of course, you have to keep producing knowledge by uh, uh, your your research. So that's that's what I uh, that's what I that's what I would say. And uh, last, perhaps, um, and again, this one probably you gave me this freedom, uh, if you will, to suggest what to do to young graduates. Do not be afraid to leave the cozy, comfortable, and nice Western world to go teach elsewhere. The world is beautiful everywhere and so rich everywhere. And the other time I was talking with my boss, who's, by the way, from Karachi herself, and she's like, Massimo, why don't you go back to Europe or Italy? I'm like, I love Prosecco. Like, I really love Prosecco and everything goes with it. But it's not the time yet. There is still more to see out there in the world. And I, you know, I, I find incredible, incredible uh, richness and wealth to be in a setting that I do not know and constantly be ignorant about <laughs> the place where I'm at. So with that, uh, with that being said, uh, Isvan, if you allow me, I'll just go to the, uh, to the presentation. I see you nodding, so. <laughs> So I'll do uh, just that. So my idea here is to go through the presentation in some 30 minutes uh, of sort, uh, inshallah, and, you know, scholars tend to break such promises with, the <laughs> uh, with consistency, but I'll try to, to be as brief as, as I can. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid I would not be able to see pictures or people who want to ask questions, but I do I recommend perhaps to just type your questions into the chat um, of Zoom. I've, I've done this a uh, few times and perhaps it can work even this time. And once my presentation is over, I'll just go back through the through the questions first time before or during the, the, the Q&A uh, session, if, that's, uh, if that may work. Okay, without further ado, let me share my screen and... Okay, let me see. Okay, I trust now my, my presentation is on, correct? Okay. So here in this project, basically, uh, I, I'll try, I'll try to um, present how my work seeks to remain true to what I said before, trying to find differences and commonalities between wars that apparently are quite alien to one another, right? So, my presentation today is titled, as you can see, Salafism, Vanguard of the Islamic World. And the context or the background of this research is that it's taken primarily from my uh, PhD uh, dissertation that I should be publishing soon or start working on publishing it soon. Um, but what you're going to see today is uh, the uh, theoretical um, excerpt, basically, the theoretical backbone of an article that is forthcoming uh, for uh, contemporary Islam um, should be out in April, I think, and it's a part of a special issue where there is a ongoing conversation about what, how we can best understand Salafism as a modern phenomenon in, uh, in Islam, and I'm very glad that I could be part of that uh, project. So, some starting point. Anytime we present something, you know, we, 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 we start from somewhere, and this is where I start from. These are my assumptions. Like, I do not question these propositions so much. Um, so, first of all, I contend, I submit, you know, and actually, or more specific, more, more technically, my, my assumption is that Islamism, the, this mixing of Islam and politics, if you will, is a modern phenomenon. It's something that we've seen, you know, maybe from the 19th century, late 19th century, all, all up until today. Salafism, the way we have known it, is an, um, a phenomenon within Islamism. And I would like now to provide a theoretical framework to understand that. These are my three uh, propositions, initial propositions, right? So. Here is how I'm gonna break down my, the rest of my uh, uh, lecture here, or, or uh, if you will. First of all, I will present you my question 
out of those three assumptions and the answer that I provide. As I tell my students, um, a research paper, a research project is not a novel from Agatha Christie. I shouldn't find out in the last page who is the, uh, is the murderer, okay? Right up, you tell me who, what is your question and what is your answer. I will do that right away. Then I will go through, you know, explaining the mechanisms, the, you know, the, the various details of what I'm trying to say here. I will uh, outline uh, the main tenets of Salafism. I will then introduce Salafism uh, through the lenses of two uh, uh, concepts, two ideas that I've taken from the work of Antonio Gramsci, a fellow uh, Italian, as you may know. So Salafism via philosophy praxis and vanguardism as the modern prince, an obvious reference to another Italian, Niccolò Machiavelli and his work. And last, uh, I'll reach the conclusion, and I'm always unsure about how to conclude because I have a very technical, academically sound uh, set of conclusion, but also something more personal. And I'll see if I want to share that with you today or not. Um, as <laughs> you, you never know, okay? I'll, uh, so if there is the academic part and the personal part, and I'll be happy to, to share that uh, with you. For sure, the first part, I'm not sure the second. So the question and the answer, right? If Salafism is part of Islamism, and if, if Islamism is a modern phenomenon, then we must ask ourselves in which way is Salafism modern? It's not enough to, draw, to, just, to just drop an adjective. What does it mean it's modern? So what I say, what I argue, what I submit to you is that Salafism is an example of vanguardism. Vanguardism is something that pertains to our modern contemporary age. It's a certain way of looking at history and politics. And Salafism, to me, is an example of that. It, it, it can be better framed as an example of vanguardism. And I do this by relying on an overall framework which is steeped in Gramscian theory. So if I want to visually present to you my overall framework. Here is what it looks like. So I have a broad conceptualization that relies on Gramscian theory with two specific concepts out of his work. One is philosophy of praxis and the other one is the modern prince. Now we get to this, of course, in due time in the course of the presentation. Within Gramscian, okay, of course, the idea of vanguardism. Uh, for those of you who do not know, um, Gramsci was actually the founder of the Italian Communist Party, and he had this idea that, you know, the party should be the vanguard of a certain political social actor, of course, was the proletariat in the Marxist parlance. And I would submit, therefore, that Salafism is nestled snugly in, within, within this framework. So if I go back to what I was saying before about my personal trajectory. I want to understand something as alien as Salafism, something as far from me personally as Salafism, in light of theories and concepts that tries to explain this difference in the context of a overarching humanity that is common to all of us. And uh, what I found also very interesting is that Salafism, then it goes the other way around. It also explained to you how you can possibly uh, refine and improve and modify your own social theoretical frameworks. It's, I don't do this in, in this particular work, but it's something, on, something else that I'm, that I'm working on at the moment. So it goes, of course, both ways. So let's go now to, to Salafism. Um, and uh, I may say things that for some members of the audience will be will be already known in case I, I do uh, uh, you know I apologize and ask for your uh, uh, patience when we go through this uh, uh, list of uh, features of Salafism. Uh, first of all, it's, it's, it's hard to even define what Salafism actually is. There's a beautiful uh, chap book chapter that I you know uh, I recently read from um, from Estatiev, a Bulgarian scholar who's like two years ago in 2021 says. Salafism is one of those essentially contested concepts. Nobody, people keep talking about it. We do not know exactly what is it. Um, and the most accepted and also very vague definition is that Salafism is a tiyar, a 
trend within Sunni Islam. It's not even a movement. People don't, don't go as far as to say it is a proper social political movement. It's just, it's just a trend. It's an approach to Sunni Islam. Um, what does characterize this approach? It's primarily an issue of epistemology, i.e. Salafism makes a claim in terms of how it uh, approaches Islam. And it is literal and scripturalist, meaning that they do not engage or they claim not to engage in anything but the reading of the Quran and the reading of the Sunnah of the Prophet without the intervention of any human interpretation as it may be uh, um, um, uh, compromised by, let's say, emotions or individual preferences or whatever else. So it is about sticking to the text and give to that text a strictly stri scripturalist interpretation. They claim that by doing so, Salafis, Salafis reach a proper scientific understanding of Islam. And they use a word that it's, I mean, you can translate Almiya with scientific, but you know, I'm sure you members of the audience understand that how problematic it is to uh, have like straight up translation, but just to give you a sense, right? So they intend Islam as not contaminated by um, um, personal, again, emotions or a, a wrong interpretation. It's scientific, it's sound, it's a proper interpretation of Islam. That entails a few uh, extra <laughs> elements that now we get to the juicy part. It's so interesting here. Because Salafis tend to reject the four legal jurisprudential school of Islam, uh, the four uh, madahid. So the Maiki, Hanafi, uh, Jafari, Shafi. And they say, no, they, they, they're not the correct ones. They, they have they have a certain leniency towards uh, Hanbali school of thought, uh, school of jurisprudence, but even there, right? In principle, not admit the, uh, the four uh, uh, jurisprudential school because they think it is a uh, undue Ac um, accretion of interpretations over the original text. So all the scholarship that great jurisprudential scholars in the history of Islam have produced over the holy texts, it's, it's not correct. It's something that goes beyond the text and we should go back to the text. It's scripturalist and literalist. Second is a strict adherence to Tawhid, the idea of yeah, again, Tawhid is a term that it's hard to, to, uh, to translate in uh, European languages. Maybe you can use monotheism. It's improper. You will forgive me. Um, so, so that nothing but the worship of Allah is um, um, endorsed and uh, uh, permissible in Islam. Let me give an example. They do not think that saints could be ever, you know, uh, uh, be object of worship on the part of the, uh, uh, of the believers. Uh, so uh, the uh, Sufi, for example, also, it's not uh, accepted within the realm of, of, of Salafism. Um, uh, similarly, they, do not accept any innovation on the original um, um, framework and structure of Islam. They call it bida. Bida is unlawful innovation. So there is this sense that something called Islam existed, of course, at the beginning when Muhammad engaged in the prophetic revelation. People who heard his message directly from him we're still within the domain of Islam. Afterwards, history, time, people corrupted his original message. And therefore, anything beyond that original message, Salaf is a real problems with. Now, they, as an upshot, as a consequence of, of, of this approach to Islam, they maintain that only Salafis have real access to truth. If Islam is the truth, they are the only ones within the realm of Islam who got it right. 
So they claim they have an exclusive and solitary. It's unique. It's not a preferential access to They are the only ones who got it right. And that entails that they manifest a sense, an inclination, a disposition of separateness from the rest of the Islamic Ummah. We will we'll get to that. There is a sense that only some Muslims understand what Salafis say, which means that only some Muslims understand what real Islam is. And that's part of the overall Salafi um, project. Now, where is salvation, right? Ultimately, you know, we're we are here to try and be saved from, from the fire of the Jehenna and, and reach paradise. So the idea of Tawhid actually connects the salvation of your soul with the salvation of your body here and there. And that's what I, what I care for, right? I mean, I'm a, I'm a political scientist by training, so I care about what happens here on the earth. And for Salafis, these salvation on earth can be obtained by replicating here and now what they look, what they consider as the uh, ultimate template of the ideal political, social, social political community. They, um, they refer to, to that as, as uh, the paradigm of the uh, as, as Salaf as Saleh, which is translate, translated in English again, the paradigm of the pious ancestors, right? It, it is exactly from the word Salaf, uh, ancestor, that they get their, uh, their label. So a Salaf as Saleh is the way in which people lived under Islam in the early days of Islam. Let's say they consider the first three generations of Muslims after the uh, revelation of Prophet Muhammad. After that, things start to degenerate. Hence, the role of the Salafis is to reconstitute that template here and now. But here I'm a, 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 I'm a killjoy. I am, well, this template doesn't have very well defined features. So man, not all, but many Salafis will start talking, for example, about the uh, Adawla al-Islamiyah, which in the current era is how you would translate that soci socio-political template into a political arrangement that can function. What actually constitutes Adawla al-Islamiyah? It's problematic. They haven't figured out yet. Of course, we have had recently someone who claimed to have reestablished the caliphate between Iraq and Syria, and it's problematic, okay? Many Salafis did not, did not particularly like uh, uh, the likes of Aish, for example, when they claimed that a new uh, template, according to a Salaf as Saleh, was reestablished in our day and age in, um, in the shape of uh, the Islamic State. So that's Salafism in a nutshell. And uh, that's probably my, my own interpretation also of, of Salafism, given you know, what the current literature says about it. But now, because again, I'm a political scientist, I'm interested in, okay, now tell me more, how can we understand exactly what Salafism is? I make reference to Gramscian philosophy of praxis, and it, and it startled me, I was really surprised when I was looking through you know, the text on Salafism and texts of Salafis themselves, when they start talking about two concepts, Aqida and Manhaj. Aqida is basically what you believe, right? I, I, I consider, I firmly believe something. And Aqida could be considered like the theoretical uh, set of ideas and concepts, right? The theory that Salafis have in their, in their head about what is proper true Islam. And then Manhaj. Manhaj is how you then translate that into the interpretation of social political reality and how you act upon it. So we had a concept which was primarily theoretical and a concept which pertained primarily to the practical. And I was like, aha, uh -huh. to me that's straight up very similar to what we consider in, the, in our social scientific lingo to theory and praxis. And I found that the way in which Salafism, Salafis tend to combine or relate to one another, Aqida and Manhaj, is quite similar to what Gramsci would consider a philosophy of praxis. So without getting into the details of Gramscian political uh, philosophy, but you know, here I have an excerpt from his you know, uh, prison notebooks, 
and he says philosophy of practice is a mass philosophy, right? So it's not an uh, ivory tower kind of construct, you know, the things that you know uh, uh, um, scholars and ideologues do uh, in their in isolation. So he says it's a mass philosophy that is not only individual elaboration, right? It's not something that pertains only to the mind of one individual scholar, but also a collective praxis, an organized political will. So Gramsci is saying ideas translate into practice and practice is informed by ideas. And when you enact that practice, you are also manifesting those ideas, right? So there is this dialectical relationship they cannot be substituted by a mere causal link between ideas to practice or practice to ideas. They go both, it goes both ways. And there is a clear political underlying logic in doing this. And I, and I was like, yeah, of course, I knew that Gramsci could help me out because he was trying to tell me, look, there is a political component here. You can find it if you look close enough into the philosophy of praxis. And let me give you an example here. The concept, the idea of kufr, right, of, and again, I'm, I'm glad that most of you speak Arabic or have a familiarity with the language. Kufr may, may be uh, translated with disbelief or unbelief. Um, like, I'm a kafir, okay? I'm not a Muslim, so I'm, I'm outside the domain of Islam to an extent. But in their intellectual theoretical elaboration, in, uh, within Aqeda and in their manhaj, in their interpretation of how to actualize those ideas. Kufr, for example, is one of the main question marks, one of the main issues that Salafis confront. So they ask themselves constantly in their writings, in their speeches, what is faith? What is disbelief? And if we understand what is disbelief, then who's an infidel? And when we find that somebody is an infidel, how should we, should we act to see more her? Is the whole issue of takfir and or jihad? What do we do? So, to be sure, Salafis have very different issues depending on which Salaf kind of Salafi they are to all these different questions. But the thing is, the relation between Aqidah, what how they think about it, and their manhaj, how they choose to act upon it, right? Always within the uh, within this framework, under this umbrella. Right, whereby the, the thinking and the doing are always, uh, always related. Um, if we have gone thus far, we said, okay, that's Salafism. This is philosophy of praxis, and we see that Salafism, you know, can be framed through the uh, through the lenses of philosophy of praxis. Then let's delve deeper into the political component of this. Vanguardism is a, a concept that has two major components. And again, I'm, I was glad to see we could, oh, sorry, we could break them down into, again, a theoretical and a practical aspect. First of all, vanguardism is a truth claim which says something about the direction and purpose of history. Um, I will make many references here, or some references here, to the one of the social theories that we know best, right? Uh, uh, Marxism. Marxism as a as a has a certain message about where history is going and the purpose of history. History goes through phases depending on what kind of mode of production you have, and we we are expecting that the communist society will eventually overthrow and superannuate capitalism. And that's the direction of history. Like Marxists and communists need only to like push history in the direction it is already supposed to be going. And at the same time, vanguardism says in order to do so, you must craft a political project which addresses a certain community of people. Communists who believe in Marxism are not going to talk to the capitalists and the bourgeois, right? They're not gonna talk to the peasants, even though we know what happened in China and parts of Russia as well, but they have to talk to the working class. The working class is the class who's supposed to be doing this. And why vanguardism says we need to do this? Well, because we can imagine a world where the current predicaments 
are no more. So if we reach a communist post-capitalist society, it's the land of milk and honey. And that's why history needs to be pushed. There is this idea of the future can rectify the ills of the present. Now, one key element of vanguardism is the idea of modern prince, if I read Gramsci correctly. Because Gramsci, of course, as I said, was um, a leader, not just an a, a, a important the theoretician of, of uh, Marxism. There needs to be an organization that brings history forward. And Gramsci understood or framed this, this organization with the term modern prince. Again, is a reference to Machiavelli, who wrote, of course, The Prince. And what is this organization that uh, we may label the, uh, the modern prince? It's an organization that has the job to actually carry forward history. And it does so by leading as the vanguard, a privileged community. So again, I make reference to Marxism here because I think we're all familiar with that kind of uh, thinking. The Communist Party will lead the proletariat, right? It's a Marxist-Leninist. It's, it's Lenin that actually comes up with this, with this idea and Gramsci develops it further. It's like, yeah, you need an organization, the, the Leninist Party, that tells the working class, you are the ones who are supposed to make history. And the organization also does the following. It claims that the interest and aims of the, of the party, of the organization itself, are the same interest and aims of the previous community it is addressing. So what is good for the party is good for the working class and vice versa. Last, vanguardism is also another important element that cannot be at any moment uh, uh, forgotten. There is the presence of the enemy. What is the enemy you know, in a vanguardist, you know, uh, vanguardist framework? Is the ultimate other that dominates the present we want to change. In the literature, this is, called the this is referred to as the negative present. So now we live in a world where you know, capitalism and the bourgeois are dominating. They are the enemy that define the other, right? The, 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 the proletariat and the working class. But once we overcome this negative present, the enemy will disappear together with it. So let's look at this framework, right? And uh, Salafism will, will be a right back in. I just made reference to, to Marxism, as I'm sure you are quite familiar with that uh, uh, set, of, uh, set of concepts. So this is what you know, uh, a visual representation of vanguardism may look like. So you have an overall population. You can consider, in this case, you know, uh, society at large. Within that society, you have a privileged community that has an historical role. That would be the, van the, the, the working class. Now, the working class is part of the vanguard, but only if the organization that understands history, that is on top of things, that they have a clear uh, access to truth, mobilizes the privileged community in order to fulfill its historical role. And this is set against an enemy that is different from the vanguard, is the major uh, threat to the vanguard. So here is how you translate Salafism, in my opinion, as vanguardism. So I just substituted the term with a, a lot of like Arabic terms here, but the enemy, what is the enemy? It's Dar al-Kufr is the domain, the abode of the unbelief of the non-Islam. The population to which you look at is Al-Umma, uh, al the Islamic community, but not all of it, because not all Muslims understand the proper message of Islam. Um, there is a, um, one a hadith that uh, Salafis are very fond of, whereby the Islamic Umma will splinter into 73 sects. And one sect is the successful one, Al-Firqa al najia al And they're like, that's our sect. That's our privileged community that we that understands the true Islam. So who's gonna lead this sect, the 73rd sect within Islam? Al-Ta'if al-Mansura, the victorious group. 
These are the guys who have actually understood what Islam is and then will lead to salvation the privileged community. The salvation, of course, is framed as the Islamic State, Adawla al Islamiyah. And again, to me, it overlaps nicely, almost to a T to an extent, with this way of thinking about history and politics that is proper of vanguardism. Now, I reach to my conclusion, and I'm, I'm going to pat myself on the shoulders because time wise, I'm doing quite well. All right. So I would, you know, submit three main points here. Salafism is an example of vanguardism in that it has an exclusionary epistemology about truth. You don't get to truth in other ways, but through the proper understanding of Islam produced and sustained and advanced by Salafism. There is a privileged community, a certain group of Muslims will understand this and an organization that will carry this forward. And uh, I'm not intending here necessarily organization as, a, as, a, as a, a formal organization. Salafis by large tend to uh, um, not use that term. They do not like it particularly, but from a theoretical conceptual uh, point of view, from, the, from, the, from a functional standpoint, that's, that's pretty much what, what they mean. And there is an historical plan of salvation. We call it communism. You call it uh, Dawla al-Islamiyah. To me, it's pretty much uh, the same. So we all, know, we all know about this guy, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, former leader of the Islamic State. He was a Salafi, not actually a good example of Salafi. I would say he, he represents a very tiny, tiny minority, but he's somebody that everybody knows, right? I could have put Bin Laden, same thing here. Most Salafis are not, not nearly as violent as this guy, but uh, for the purpose of you know, clear communication with the audience, I chose his picture. And we can sum up my thesis with this. They, all, they both speak from a pulpit, both Lenin and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and their way of operating in the context of modernity is, is eerily similar to me. They follow very similar uh, uh, pathways and modes of operation. And I think that's a way in which you can understand Salafism as a modern concept, as a modern phenomenon. Um, well, Notes from Underground, I'm sorry, I don't know why I chose this title. It's one of the, my favorite novels from, from Dostoevsky. And uh, I thought, OK, this is a little bit more, right? Uh, this is my personal uh, 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 addendum to this. Uh, each you know, um, which I would like to, to share with you, of course. So first, first of all, um, I remember reading a, a few years back, um, uh, The Age of Extreme by uh, Obsmum. I'm, I'm sure most of you will be familiar with the uh, series of, you know, um, four volumes of uh, modern contemporary history by, um, by Eric Obsmum. And he said something in the, in, the, in the last volume. He said, the Vanguard organization is the most powerful technology of the 20th century. Of course, he, came, he coined the idea of the short 20th century to tell us how incredibly important the experience of the Soviet revolution had been for, for our contemporary world. And that revolution came out of the work of a vanguardist party whose mode of operation then spread across the world. And to me, this is a vindication of Obstom intuition here. The vanguard, the vanguardist party, the vanguard way of thinking about politics, incredibly powerful and still uh, very much with us. Now, it it professes, it preaches epistemological exclusivity, which means that to me, it's inherently anti-pluralist and anti-democratic. And if you care about pluralism and democracy, being a vanguardist. It's, it's something you should not contemplate very much. Um, and it, when I try to, to make sense of how you know, a vanguardist would think, I always, and this is you know, my, uh, um, uh, my being quite open to you about my personal preferences, I, I believe in democracy. And I'm like, yeah, if you do that, we're going to have a problem. And in particular, I was reading, you know, in conjunction to, to you know, to studies on Salafism and, and, and things of that nature of political Islam, a, a very interesting book 
uh, by Alex Pollan, not very known. It's called uh, Lenin and the End of Politics. And, uh, you know, the consideration of the author at the end was that a Leninist and therefore a van vanguardist disposition could entail the end of politics. And um, I'm not sure that concluding with a long quotation is a good thing to do, but I will do it nevertheless and I will, you know, roll the dice here. And Poland, at the end of his book, it's a 1984 book, so right, the Soviet Union was still alive and kicking. So he says the following, and again, this is not somebody who knew anything about Salafism at all, but he says, political efforts to extinguish the source of our discontents, our negative present, the predicaments in which we live, even and perhaps especially when they're successful, must also rob us of the essential delight of being human. The problem is of always new and different sensations, emotions, understandings, relations, and meanings. Politics is not about finding a permanent solution, like the vanguardists would say. Politics is about keep on elaborating on better answers to the current predicaments that can never be really overcome. Ozonen says, politics is the field for the exploration of this ambiguity of a life in time and also the only civilized mode for expressing and confronting and controlling those problems to which civilization gives rise. So the good thing is not to submit to a vanguardist project that tells us what history is necessarily leading to, but is to keep having conversation about what kind of history we want to live. And that can only be achieved if we reject any exclusive, anti-pluralistic, and dogmatic view of history itself. And with this, I will uh, conclude. And I really thank you for, for your attention. I hope I didn't bore you too much. Thank you so much. And Isvan, uh, back to you. Uh, not quite yet, uh, because I'm not sure whether this was the personal conclu uh, conclusion, what you promised. So I like no, to I did. That. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, you're so attentive. Yeah. <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> Let, let's see where the conversation goes. But uh, yeah, I, it, it is something that, I, that it gave me pause and... Uh, Thoughts, uh, because you life. you beautifully said that that okay it shouldn't be an Agatha Christie novel, and then you put up the most most <laughs> exciting suspense. I, I will see whether I will tell it to you or not. Now you have to say <laughs> you, you you do have to say it, please. Um, I've seen so basically I talked about vagarism with two examples, right? Mark, Marxist Leninist communism and, and Salafism, and I see vanguard and, and I do not like either of them from a personal standpoint, from a value standpoint, I'm really troubled by them because they're incredibly dogmatic and they present one truth to, to which we all must agree. It's not a choice. There is a right interpretation of the Quran and there's a right interpretation of the modes of production. And there is nothing else outside it. And I've seen some similar trends developing uh, in regards to other issues that project one truth only that shall not be discussed or really uh, 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 confronted, especially within academia. Um, I can go a little bit further, uh, it's fun, but I am somebody who likes to ask questions about anything. And the moment I'm, that I'm told that you cannot ask that question because that's politically incorrect to ask that question, I get, oh my gosh, is here somebody who tells me that they have the truth in their pockets? As we say in Italian, la verità in tasca. And uh, I cannot engage anymore in discussions and conversations about topics that I want to have a conversation about because the truth has already been discovered by somebody else. That troubles me a lot. And I think we're, we're living in a very weird age in academia where there is a sense of censorship within our communities about what's proper to ask and what shall not be asked. And I have problems with that on a, from a personal standpoint. <laughs> I think I do, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much indeed, uh, Massimo. That, yes, I'm, I'm very glad I insisted on this. Uh, uh, yes, and thank you for, for, for daring to share it, share it with, uh, with us. Um, also, just before we, I, I hope people, people have uh, 
as many questions as, as I do, and I would I would like you to 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 have your questions for, before me, no, not to abuse with sure. my my role of chair. Um, I just think the one, the chat uh, is funny. They can uh, one one uh, before up, yeah. we go to the questions. I I wanted to to say that uh, you're uh, I'm immensely grateful. Uh, well. The, for the talk and the introduction and and the personal conclusion, um, and I, I just wanted to say your your humbleness is humbling, oh, and, no, and it was a, it was a wonderful example, and that's that's why we 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 want we want the majlises to be to be really varied to show different ways to come to academia and different ways to do do academia, and and your talk was really really a sublime. Uh, example of that. So, so yes, it, it, uh, thank you very much. And uh, before I sw switch off the camera for for the the, the questions, um, I'd like to advertise the, uh, next week's uh, uh, much list, which will be that of Livnat, who is here, and I paste it here so you those who haven't registered yet and are are here you can you can register even now right now um thank you thank you again i'll stop the recording and we will start the discussion